uh, I'll just say thank you first for coming, um, for taking the time out of what is apparently a tremendously busy um, schedule. Um, and I think for what we would hope to get out of this is to get to know you a bit better, for you to know who we are and to see and maybe identify areas of common purpose. Um, so before we get too far, maybe what we'll do quickly um, is just go around the table and just have everyone introduce themselves. So Kathleen and others who are online, uh, we know who's here. And, um, and then I'll, I'll take it back and we'll go further into the conversation. Um, so maybe I'll start with you. And then we'll come back to you and you can introduce the program as well. We go around the table. Right. My name is Paul Patton. I'm the Council for Public Affairs at the U.S. Mission in Geneva. Uh, I'm Tia Pula. I am the founder and curator of the website What the United States. Okay. Please speak up because I'm not sure if Kathleen was here for a Did, did you get that? Mostly, yes. Okay. Good. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, my name is Melissa Kapitanoy. I'm a journalist at Global from Zambia. Hello, I'm Marina Alhoff. I'm coming from the Lagos for Women's Human Rights Organization. Um, hi, my name is uh, Nicolas Seyler. I work in the policy department at the Internet Society and focusing on the human rights issues. Hello, my name is Seth Kazun from Palestine, founder of the Deal for Social Media. Hello, my name is Jessica Musilla. I am from Kenya. Say again. My name is Jessica Musilla from Kenya. And Thank I you. I'm on Hello, I'm Ritu, and I'm working in India. I'm working with Digital Empowerment Foundation, and we are most of the time connecting people through the unlicensed spectrum. Hello, I'm Anna Debrina. I'm from G Media, the NGO partner of the US Mission in organizing the IFM program. Hi, I'm Andrew Danto. I work with Paul at the US Mission in Public Affairs. Hi, I'm Dean Mars Mission. I am also with G Media. Hi, I'm Michael Kennedy. I'm the chief economist here at the Internet Society. Jeremy? <laughs> Jeremy, I'm the IT technician at uh, Geneva's office myself. And, uh, my name is Yves uh, and I work with uh, Paul and Andrew at the public press section of the US Mission. Excellent. And Kathleen? I'm Kathleen Moriarty. I'm currently one of serving as one of the IETF security area directors, and uh, my colleague Stephen Farrell is the other one. And um, I'm pretty much doing that full time at the moment, helping to progress work in the IETF, um, work with the various working groups to get their work through and improve protocols. And um, Stephen and I and the security directorate also review protocols before they go out to full publication. And uh, my employer is EMC. So just to um, pause, you are now in um, the land of the internet where we have a lot of acronyms and we enjoy that. Um, but the internet engineer, the IETF is the Internet Engineering Task Force. This is a group of engineers uh, from around the world that create the sort of underlying architecture for the internet, the protocols that make your email, talk to my email, that where we can move bits around the world and our, we can all the, the networks are interoperable. That's really done through the Internet Engineering Task Force. And um, they have working groups. And one a big area, of course, of focus for the technical community right now is security and privacy. How do you embed security and privacy into the protocols that we all use so that we continue to trust the, the Internet? And um, Kathleen is one of the, the leaders of that work in the IETF right now. Um, and uh, so when we talk about empowering women through the internet, uh, both on it and, and in the technology, Kathleen is a good example of, of working on the technical side. So um, anyway, sorry, I just figured if, I don't know if you knew IETF, so I thought I should at least uh, introduce that. Thank you for expanding on that. I appreciate it. <laughs> is there anybody else on the room 
remote bridge that wants to introduce themselves. I see two others. It's just uh, Nicholas and me. Nicholas and me. <laughs> so we're all here. All right. Uh, Paul, maybe I'll turn to you and maybe can you introduce the program, um, the fellows, and then we'll take it from there. All right. Thank you, um, Sally. Um, the Internet Freedom Fellows program was initially conceived by uh, the U.S. Ambassador to the Human Rights Council, the, the previous one, not the one who's currently there. It was back in 2010, I, I believe, and the idea was to was to uh, forge links and, and you know, identify the intersections between the human rights community and, and the struggle for protecting and promoting human rights around the world and information technology, specifically social, social media and, and the internet. Um, every year now for the past five years, we've identified five uh, uh, participants from around the world. We in Geneva solicit nominations from our, our brother or sister embassies uh, around the world. Any country is um, uh, eligible to submit nominations. However, we, we admit we have a bias towards countries where development and freedom of expression and freedom of association are less protected. So if you're a nominee from, say, a Western European country, that, that puts you at a disadvantage, although if you have a strong um, justification, you, we, we do consider we do consider those those countries as well. They spend a week here in in Geneva, our, our fellows, and then a week in the United States. Their time in Geneva always coincides with uh, a session of the Human Rights Council. You may know that the Human Rights Council meets three times a year: March, uh, June, and September. So this year they're obviously here for the for the June session. Uh, they they meet with people directly involved in human rights in the Human Rights Council in the debates of the Human Rights Council and with the larger international Geneva community, uh, people who are involved on the one hand in issues of human rights, and on the other hand in issues of in internet freedom uh, and everything associated with the internet. For, for example, um, Sally mentioned uh, the, the phrase empowering people um, through information technology, which you know sounds like a cliche for a lot of people, but for us, that's real words. We that's where the rubber meets the road because these these the people that we that we are um, uh, that we have identified as as fellows are in fact using information technology to empower real people who who need in, empowering. Uh, just to to recap, our fellows this year are coming from from Zambia, from Kenya, from Belarus. From Palestine, uh, don't tell me, and from Brunei. Um, so and each 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 of these countries has their own issues about freedom, human rights, freedom of association, freedom of expression, and, and particularly this year, the theme is um, uh, information technology and empowering women. So uh, each of our of our participants this year has a special interest in in women's issues. Uh, that's not always the case, but that's the case this year. Excellent. Well, and needless to say, they all have brilliant CVs. And I know. Great. I've got the, the list here, and I, we're going to dig in here. Um, just to give you a little bit of context for the Internet Society, if you if you don't know who we are, um, we are a global nonprofit organization. We um, have chapters around the world in some of your countries, and it might be interesting to um, connect some of you. I know in Palestine, we have a, an Internet Society chapter, for example, um, that might be of interest to you going yes. forward. Um, our, our, we, were, we were created or stood up as a nonprofit organization in the 90s, in the early 90s, um, by uh, this is a controversial term for this session, by the, some of the fathers of the internet um, in um, the 90s, who they wanted to accomplish a few things through a society. One was that this thing, this Internet Engineering Task Force, which was a very loose consortium of engineers at the time, needed an organizational structure, a home, so to speak. And engineers really like to do engineering, but they really didn't want to do legal things or marketing or financing and things like that. So the Internet Society became the home, the organizational umbrella for the work of, the, of this, this technical community. But in addition to that, they, they, the founders of the kind of brains of the internet really deeply believed that the value of the internet 
um, grew the more people that were connected to it. And that this medium had the potential, and think about this, this was in 1992. It was just on the earliest stages of commercialization. It was just starting to grow. And they really felt like the value was going to come the more people that came online. But in order for that to happen, you needed people who could you know, build the technology, sustain the technology, run it. I mean, everything from country code, top level domain names, so your .ca or your um, uh, you know, your, your dot UKs, whatever, they needed to be managed. People needed to have the skills to do the, the physical management of the internet. So we had, there was capacity building that was desperately needed around the world. So the earliest days of the internet society were really focused on building the technical capacity of countries to connect. Because they felt, they believed that once they connected, there was a whole, um, Potential there's all this opportunity that would emerge from that and of course that's proven to be the case um, So there was a lot of capacity building it was development. It was technology and in recent years as, as We're all keenly aware governments have become more and more interested in the media Again, if you think about 1992 a lot of governments kind of shrugged their shoulders and said well That's an interesting science project, but we're not we don't really see a lot of value in it you fast forward to today, you see the Human Rights Council, you see the ITU, you see all sorts of a range of UN agencies, national governments, regional governments, all talking about the internet. And what we try to contribute is an understanding of how the technology actually works and what are the consequences of policy decisions on the value proposition of the internet. Um, and that's a lot of the work Michael does as, as an economist of thinking through what are the economic implications of, of actions on global interoperability. Um, we are increasingly active on the human rights side of things because um, we see this intersection between you know, trusting the internet and innovation and expression. And so the technologies that you need to deploy to be safe, to do the work that you do in your country safely, to trust this medium to do what you're trying to do, requires the work that Kathleen is doing and other um, engineers to make that possible. So it's not, again, it's not just about bits, it's about what do people do with them and, and can they trust it and can they carry out things that, they, that are meaningful to them. Um, the way we do this is through, like I said, we have chapters. We have over 100 chapters around the world. These are volunteers who believe in a global open internet and are active in their local communities. We have organizational members, which are um, companies, sometimes academic institutions, other organizations that, are, that contribute to our work. Um, but we are a principled, cause-based organization, so we advocate. We advocate for a vision of the internet. Um, and we love this kind of a program because we think that you as individuals, and at least what I read on here, embody that. Um, the, 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 you embody what we hope the technology could achieve. Um, so I, I think it's important, and, and I, I love the theme, women and girls in the role of, of IT, um, and I, I hope we can have a conversation here about um, I, Nico has a nice theme here that, that you know, does, does the internet empower women or do women empower the internet or both? I, I think if I could state my bias, I'd probably say both. Um, but I, I hope maybe we can have an initial discussion about this theme and how it links into some of the work that you're doing in your countries and I'd be really interested to hear from you. Um, what your projects are, what your goals are with with this, and again, maybe we, at the end we see where there's intersection between what we're doing on the technology side and what you're doing um, really at the at the edges of the network. Um, so it's a very open-ended question, but I um, Nico has his hand up. Is there logistical? Yeah, no, just uh, just so you know, so we have about twelve um, oh, good. people who uh, are listening. Uh, so for the remote participants, just so you know, you can share questions and comments uh, using the Q&A uh, option in Zoom, uh, and I will you know, read it out to the audience. Uh, we just had coffee from the Ghana chapter of the Internet Society saying uh, hi to everybody. Hello, coffee. It's great to, great to, well, I don't see you, but we know you're there. Does coffee have a question? 
Uh, not for now, but not for now. Maybe later. But could we? Um, could I turn to the fellows and see if, if anybody wants to kick off the discussion and talk a little bit about your projects or what motivates you, um, particularly in light of this theme? Anybody willing to go first? Uh, I can go first. Okay. Um, so I run and I founded, run and curate the website Why We Not Use Feminism. Um, this is because um, there were growing concerns about sexual harassment, uh, especially in, despite the fact that we have equal education, equal, um, good healthcare, et cetera. But um, there were a lot of people starting to talk about sexual harassment and uh, authorities not doing anything about it. And there was also a lot of um, issues about how women are pressured to be certain ways, um, particularly in light with Islamic values. But at the same time, men are not put up on the same, um, they don't have the same expectation for men to live up to certain um, Islamic values. Um, part of the reason why I started Web United Needs Feminism is because we have really bad historical documentation for women. And I thought that having this website um, available for everybody would be good in terms of trying to get people to see Muslim women, especially in Southeast Asia, which is a very understudied area, um, to understand women um, are very different, Islamic women are very different worldwide. Um, I do think part of um, Brunei women are quite liberated, but they are also um, pressured in other ways that women in other countries um, are pressured differently. Um, so the project's more long term, it's um, historical documentation for the future. And I know some schools have actually used the websites in sociology classes and um, for debates. Um, so I think that itself, because um, we don't have a lot of documentation for um, how women are like in Brunei, uh, it really helps students now, mm. young people, to understand um, the kind of social issues that we have to face. That sucks. I turn to you. Um, yes, um, my project is mainly civic tech uh, because in Kenya we need uh, citizens to engage the politicians on the issues because our politics tends to be very tribal and not really concerned about the work that needs to happen on development that needs to happen in the country. It's all about personalities and what communities they represent, and, and that's it. Yeah. So nothing gets done. So by spotlighting the work that's going on in the house um, and our parliament is by Camero, um, then we hope to empower the citizen to actually ask questions uh, because the work that we, uh, the, that the parliamentarians actually do in the house is what we pay them for. Everything else that they do outside and trying to foment public debate on the non-issues really doesn't matter. Yeah. Um, and that's the only way we're going to raise the standard of democracy in our country. And so that's our the network to get voices out there, get the public uh, acknowledging or even learning about what they need to ask the politicians. And on the other hand, uh, providing a public record of all the information that is already tight, uh, locked up in, in Parliament. Yeah, mm -hmm. and, and not easily accessible because a lot of documentation that is in Parliament is uh, accessible only as PDFs. Nobody has time to sit through that. But if you really speak to their heart by uh, uh, touching um, the parliamentarian that they particularly voted for, um, then, you are, then it becomes closer to them. It needs to be accessible to them if you're going to raise the level of discourse. Yeah. Okay. So do you do this on a, is this a volunteer? Basis. Do you have a group of people that, that work with you on this? Um, when it started, it started actually as a hobby. I'm not the I'm not the one who started it. Mm -hmm. Um, but the one of the people who started it, one of them is a lawyer, and the other is a tech premier. And they decided to do this as a hobby. In 2005, the circumstances were very different. Kenya was still a very close state, and multi-party multi democracy, um, even though it was in place, the um, the constitution was really against a lot of tenants. So when we changed constitution to 2010, then that we, we had it gave us a chance to invent what that um, what the project could do. Mm -hmm. And I got involved with them in 2011, and I've actually been uh, part of the process of moving it from being a blog to a self-sustaining site and now an organization. Um, open data has made our work very easy. Mm -hmm. 
because what happens is uh, I have to celebrate because there are two parliaments in Africa which are really progressive, the South African one and Kenyan one, mm -hmm. in terms of what, even though yes, information is still closed up, uh, at least it's accessible regularly, mm -hmm. especially with the, the enhanced debates. Uh, information is accessible every time or shortly a day later and that makes it very possible for us to go ahead and just take the information and sink it to our site without us having to do much more beyond that. So our site actually started with that. We said let's take the information that is already readily accessible from parliament and use it. And then um, there's something called constituency development fund. That information is already available from our board uh, but many times people don't know this. So we just take the same document. So we're opening up public documents that have been generated using taxpayer money yeah, to taxpayers, mm -hmm. essentially. Yeah, to empower them. You, they already paid for it. So they can ask questions about it. And politicians work for us. And I have to say, in Africa, many of them don't, uh, most of our people don't realize that. Mm -hmm. yeah. I have a couple of questions for you. <laughs> um, what was the year of there was in, there were elections and then there was some serious post-election violence? It was primarily uh, inter-ethnic violence. Yes. In what what year was that? That two thousand and seven December. Two thousand and seven and early two thousand and eight. And subsequently, there was a lot of controversy. Some people were almost uh, indicted by the International Criminal Court and, yes. and, and, and the rest of it. Does your does does your operation delve into that? Ask questions. About, about what happened then, or is that a taboo subject? Um, we will ask only for as long as we know what is backed by law, because we don't want to have start, start having legal cases against right. us. Yeah. So, provided there's a public record of discussions set up, well, whether it be they court court decisions that are moving the discussion or should be forming the discussion in Parliament, how is the boss spotlighting what is being discussed in the floor of the house? Um, um, decisions that parliamentarians should be making in sync with the constitution and the laws that have been implemented since. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we, the only thing that is on our site that is our own personal opinion, most times informed by the legal framework in the country, is the, the blog, which we call the editorial. If you go on our page, the first thing that you see, that is our, that's our personal opinion. And we, we, we go out of our way to make sure we see experts if we don't, they're not topic, we, they're not knowledgeable about the subject, so that we don't have cases after us. Yeah, because yeah, already the work we do is not, is not uh, very easy. Mm -hmm. um, but the nice thing is that now politicians also reach out to us and ask for information. If they, they, they're not sure where to get it or they, they know parliament is sitting in the of conversation yeah. uh, on Twitter too. And actually, a lot of conversation happens on Twitter uh, in Kenya about politics. And so, what happens is, uh, if they can't access something, they will tweet to us and ask, "Where is this information? Can you get it for us?" Uh, and even the politicians sometimes reach out and say, "This is what I'm doing about something," and, and they make sure they type, they they, they check our our tag us on. Um, and then they will also sometimes keep retreating what we are saying, especially when they are doing a good job. <laughs> they, yeah, so that, that in itself becomes social capital, we, we, uh, also helps to move the conversation forward because then, then we are not seen as the adversary always, but we are skipping on the issues. Sai, maybe I can turn to you, tell us a little bit about what you're doing, Palestine. Um, actually, um, when I give you the card, this here is our slogan: "Every life is a platform." Uh, this is what we believe in as an individual or as organizations. So we believe that each one of us has something to tell. So recently, watching the social media grow so fast in Palestine and the internet access and mobiles and uh, high tech. A uh, number of IT students in universities uh, watching. I uh, was uh, before we started talking with Nicholas about the level of uh, uh, or what kind of initiatives that people is building in Palestine, micro businesses, IT, etc. If you go to Gaza, recently where uh, uh, a report at the uh, Jazeera uh, talking about the number of 
initiative there in a, in a very closed place. This is really incredible. So, um, me myself was thinking of uh, projects that growing growing in my brain. Then I said I need to to uh, to build an official one. Then was that year. That year means change. Um, it's a non-profit company. Uh, our vision is uh, how or oh, we were thinking of how to uh, create um, social media channels and provide the, and give it to the people so they can speak directly with decision makers. So here, the first one was Blockbus. Blockbus is very simple. The concept is simple that we training people on how to block on different issues, political, economic, social, etc. health. Um, uh, then we found that each blogger is working alone. So there is no blogger community in Palestine. They're not, they're not strong. Their message is spread into pieces. So decision makers cannot follow their, their job, their work. So I, I created a blog bus having bloggers around Palestine in a bus. We each visit, we go to a, a place, mainly marginalized places. Uh, so we go there, we meet real people, real, real things. We, we blog, we, we use mobiles to, to live stream using live stream applications. Um, connected to media, traditional media as well, to the radio and TV. So everything is not only connected to social media, as well as traditional media. This was the first, the first uh, project. Why we created this? Because we want to build a, com a social media community. So the message goes direct to the decision makers. The message is one at the end. So the impact and the influence is bigger. Later on, I thought that we need to build follow-up system. Because talking about access to information, and uh, corruption, uh, transparency, um, this is these words are really big now in Palestine. So there was there were a gap between people, decision makers, and people and citizen reporters. So that that that, that the solution was building you know that. So I can I connect all parties in one platform so they can. Uh, people, citizen reporters, with the you know app, can take a photo for a problem, the street, or the health sector, whatever. They post it to the platform. It goes directly to the decision makers. Inside, there is a follow-up system. The follow-up system generate. Um, it's like lighting on the issue. So we're lobbying. So we're advocating on if these decision makers find a solution to my problem or still not. Why we bought it for you? Why you're having salary from the government? So this process. Later on, later on, we're going to target really very sensitive issues in the communities. Last one is mapping hair. Mapping hair is uh, it's about data visualization. Again, the same concept, but focusing on women issues. So if you the app is like, looks like our map, a Palestinian map. If you go there, you see uh, lights. Here, if you click, you will have infographic and data about women caught cancer displays or harassment uh, issues or uh, violence or access to information or about women or about the law itself. So, because I, I found there is a gap even in this sector, this is mainly what we're doing. At the end, that yield is, is the official body. We're hoping that we can. Uh, make change in the system at all. No, we'll make change in the society through investing in social media. Thank you. Is it Nalise? Is it Nalise or Nalise? Nalise. Nalise. Oh, I can't pronounce it so well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's Nalise. Okay. Yes. Um, I run a blog called Tokyo Mind. Essentially, what it's um, it's uh, mainly concentrated on uh, reproductive health. So it started a few years ago when I noticed that there was um, a missing link when it came to women talking about sexual reproductive health. There wasn't much happening in that area. We had men dictating what needed to be done when it came to issues of uh, uh, reproductive health. 
I think uh, what inspired me, especially at that time, was when they announced the levels of HIV in the country. And of course, the levels were much higher in women than they were in men. But then we saw the, most of the campaigns that were taking place or, women, or, or those people that were actually coming out and the interventions were so much on, on the men themselves instead of the women or even participating in meetings or anything related to that. It was all men and yet women were the, the ones that were most affected. And then I realized it was because most even just ordinary women, and we're talking about uh, those in high level positions, they, talking about it, talking about sex in my country, among us women is just something that we, we don't do. Especially going out there and uh, putting it out there on social media. It's, it's just something that most women really didn't feel comfortable to talk about. And then of course, followed later, high levels of cervical cancer in the country, all coming from, would say, sex. And so for me, when I started the blog, I mostly, you know, it started with just posting uh, information on where you can get screening, what treatment was available, and, and stuff like that. Eventually, women now started, of, although at the time they wouldn't uh, immediately, you know, comment, but they would inbox and have all these questions that they needed to, to find out. Then eventually I realized, you know, they were thinking I'm an expert, which I'm not. <laughs> so now I was forced to go out there and get in touch with the retail experts <coughs> and doctors. And eventually it became uh, a real group where women were able to, to, to ask and the doctors were able to either directly uh, respond to those questions or through me give their opinion their professional opinion and then i'll post it on on the on on the blog but then you know with the internet in my country it's very very strong so i realized that when it came to the blog side and uh, facebook facebook was more accessible so i moved although the blog does still exist we are more active on, on, on Facebook because now I have a, a, a Facebook page. This one is much easier and they're able to, almost every person that has access to a phone has access to, to Facebook. So it's much more active and yeah, it's, it's continuing. The work is still continuing. I mean, I'll let everybody speak and then we'll hopefully have more of a discussion. It doesn't just need to be me, but I'll um, maybe turn to um, Irina. Am I saying it correctly? Yeah. Turn the wrap. Tell us a little bit about what you're doing in your project. So the organization I'm working for, we are focusing on cleaning and issues. It's a human trafficking prevention. Prevention of human trafficking, uh, gender-based violence, especially domestic violence, and uh, tackling gender inequality. So we can see that gender inequality is a root cause of uh, women's rights violation. And uh, we're trying to combine two levels of work. It's a, it's a grassroots level, so we provide services for women who are in need, who are in need and uh, who are affected by these issues. And we bring this concern to the decision-making level. So it's not the uh, I mean, before you start talking about your rights, you have to realize you are at the level of your needs. So everything is starting from your needs. But any government has any commitment to satisfy all the needs of people. They do have commitment to satisfy the rights, to meet the rights. So this is how we connect this level because you know, women come to our programs, sometimes uh, they want to hear the human rights concept from the very last uh, time. You know, at the very last, it's not the very first thing which is coming to their mind. First, they have to, they want to have their need, needs met, and then they are ready to realize that there is a connection between what they are going through and the human rights standards. And this is how it's being developed. And the recent issue we have trying to focus it's a hate speech against women in the internet, against women's, uh, women's activists, and against those who express. Uh, I believe in this, uh, the value of gender equality. So I'm not an expert in the internet or media, 
but I'm an expert in women's rights and I'm trying to see how internet can serve women better in realizing their rights and protecting their rights because I mean answering your question you put for discussion, I would say definitely both because women can empower internet and definitely internet can, can empower women. Mm -hmm. Very nice. So I, many of you have have um, you represent really the end user community for the technology, right? And you're making use of it. And the theme is is to empower women, but you're making use of it in your in your communities. Um, Kathleen is um, also making use of the technology, but she's also helping to build it. And I don't know how many of you have been around the, the engineering community, um, but it is, um, you women are, are emerging as, as technology forces, um, but we're still definitely um, a minority. And so it creates its own sets of, of challenges and interesting dynamics. So Kathleen, I wondered if you could speak a little bit about um, the work that you do. Um, and, and I think a lot of the work that you do is what makes what they're all doing safe and secure and, and able to be um, trusted. So, and, and could you specifically, please, if, as part of your response, could you address this, this question of um, discrimination against women in technology, which as you know is kind of a hot topic in the United States and in other parts of, of, <laughs> of the world. Um, sure, and that would be a lot easier than the topics you're all grappling with. I'm humbled, first of all, to be on this panel and to hear the work that you're doing. I just needed to start out saying that. Um, thank you for doing all of your human rights and equality work, it's just, just tremendous. Um, so in terms of, I think, how the internet can empower women is, uh, it goes to some communication patterns that work more effectively for women and men. And um, if, at least in the US, there's been just a ton of research emerging and articles coming out that emphasize uh, different communication styles. So women tend to be collaborative leaders, right? So we don't, um, you don't push your opinions in the same way. Now, you might do it in subtle ways and bring them out um, differently, but it's a very different approach. Um, in meetings, we also wind up with lots of scenarios where women get spoken over by, by men and interrupted, and that's been a problem. And the Internet's interesting because I know a number of women that use written communication as a way to overcome that. So you might write papers, write blogs, and get your word out that way. So that attribution of your specific work would still go to you as a woman. Uh, unfortunately, that's another pattern where you might say something in a meeting, and, uh, and this is well documented, and a man will repeat the same thing later in the meeting because nobody heard the woman say it, and they take over that idea. But if you're able to use the internet, and you write an article, a blog, um, an email, it's written, this came from you, and it, it gives uh, traceability. So it's one way that women are using the internet to empower themselves and to raise themselves up a bit. Um, and that might be one of the equalizers that we have, at least for the IETF, because we do have lots of written communication. And, you know, we've had a little surge of women leadership in the past year to two years and it's been really nice to see that and you know they're all really well qualified women and just and and the men on the leadership are also really well qualified and, and everybody's been great to work with i think one of the key differentiators i've noticed uh just from the u.s is your leadership support and at least for the ietf i can say you know yari as the current chair has been wonderful and that makes a complete difference in the tone of a group, how the interactions work, and the support for women and minorities within that group. So he's just been a great supporter and it's made a big difference. And I have worked for tech companies where it's been more difficult and you have to be creative and use things like written communications to um, make your ideas known and you know, even I've led successful, very successful uh, projects where I've done collaborative leadership 
and they were across, you know, multiple business units and I met my deadlines and a man would be running a project and, uh, you know, might not have the same results because of the leadership style with, with that type of, of management. And, um, it was interesting to see it took a while before I got the acknowledgement and it took other people providing feedback on me on their own for that acknowledgement to happen. So we still have a lot of struggle in terms of that in the U S and technology, the whole area of technology, as uh, mentioned, it, it's an area where women really have to emerge more and we have a lot more work to do. The IETF, we only have about, uh, I think on average about 12, maybe a little bit more percent women attending meetings. Um, I am very pleased to say tomorrow I'm running a workshop with the IAB and ISOC and we have 20% women, which is huge. It sounds, it's, it's terrible that that's huge, but that's, that's a really good number. Um, and I think uh, we need to do a lot more to encourage, at least in the U.S., younger women to get into tech and stay into tech. I had an amazing experience this morning, and I was just really very flattered by it. A young woman come up to me and introduced herself because she had some IET-related questions about crypto. But she introduced herself saying that she had been reading my blogs and that she was a fan. And I mentioned that because I think it's really important that women and and each of you are you know getting your stories out there so that people and and whatever it is that you're promoting so that other women hear your messages and can say you know she did that so i can do that too um just as a way of encouraging more women and uh you know this this young woman who said this today you know i can already tell she's on to a path where she's going to do some great things and she'll influence other women but it was just, you know, just my blogging and, and writing articles and publishing made a difference for somebody that is based out of New Zealand. And I just, you know, so we have a lot to overcome and I think it depends on the sector. So I think security in particular, women are more drawn to that because women tend to like to solve problems. So, you know, listening to each of you, you're all working on, you know, really big problems. And that tends to be at least what the research says what women are drawn towards, solving a problem that, that you know, has an impact. And so I think we see a few more women on the security side for IT than other areas, like gaming, you'll see gaming in the news, and that's really problematic for women, and they're really scrutinized, and I wouldn't, I, I would find that very difficult and challenging environment to be in. So I do think um, it does vary from different parts of ICT in terms of the response and receptiveness to women and the percentages of women within those groups. But encouraging younger women is really important. And I know I personally need to take on doing a bit more of that and getting to younger age groups. I guess that 10 to 12 age group is the really important one. Um, and I personally haven't done enough there and, and need to start. Um, does that answer your question or was there something more specific? It raises a question in my mind. Who's reading your blog? You mentioned New Zealand. So obviously you're getting across the Indian Ocean down to New Zealand, but do you think in Latin America, in Africa, in Asia, is anyone reading it? And if not, that seems to be a bad thing. We should get, we should get people to read it, right? You, you guys should. Right. So yeah, in these particular blogs, it was probably uh, more through the incident response community. And so uh, the first community would have had some awareness. Um, uh, but now I guess I'm, uh, I'm still blogging through RSA and I'm trying to also blog through the IETF. So I've been publishing my blogs in two different directions. And I don't know how well we promote the IETF blogs. Um, it's one stream of blogs, not well, I thought so. Um, Sally's shaking her head. Um, it's one stream of blogs that comes from any of the area directors. So it's just a, quite a range of topics. Um, so it's not as easy to follow a person if you are following a person. So that's one reason I blog in two places in case somebody's following me as a person through um, the RSA blogs and the RSA conference because there's so many people that attend RSA conference that are security people um, and as well as the IETF because I think we really need to be promoting the work that's happening there and listening to each of you it really made me think the privacy work we're doing 
is even more important. I, I sat in a number of sessions this morning and I brought up some of the privacy work, like we're hiding DNS um, names in the future in searches so that if somebody in a particular country was searching for something that maybe isn't um, okay within their country, uh, it might not get flagged and they'll be able to do these searches and get the information that they need without being scrutinized for that. And this community was very much up in arms about that saying, but wait a second, we're not gonna have access to that data to do security research. But then listening to each of you, I'm like, mm, this is really important. Well, you so know, I, I wanna learn more from you guys. It was interesting this morning, um, I, I mentioned uh, earlier that uh, David Kay, who's the special rapporteur of the Human Rights Commission on Freedom of Expression, just issued a big report on encryption and the importance of encryption and anonymity for the expression of human rights. And so the work that you're doing, you want to be doing safely. In some cases, you might want to do it anonymously. Um, you, and, and one of the things that he mentioned, there was a, an interesting dimension that I think hasn't been explored nearly enough. Is one of our human rights is the ability to form an opinion and to express that opinion. Our searches, our activities online are part of the forming of that opinion. And there is data that is associated every time you do a search that gets left behind. And um, unless we implement things that, that ensure privacy, that ensure encryption, that ensure anonymity, and your ability to form and express that opinion. You may go looking for something and decide that's not my opinion. I, my opinion is over here, my identity is over here, but I, the search contributed to that. And yet, you know, so the, the ability to do that securely, safely, without being interfered with is hugely important for all of our ability to form an opinion. And the technology is making, can make that easier or harder. And this report, I think, emphasizes there's a lot of work to be done in that space about how to protect that right online. And, and, and just bouncing on that, because you mentioned encryption, I'm actually wondering, because many of your projects are about transparency, mm -hmm. actually. So I was wondering what was your vision of, Security, I mean, between yeah. being very transparent in your initiatives and at the same time, do you feel you have to use tools to be anonymous online uh, because there are you know, the dangers of being out there on the internet? Well, what, what's your view between transparency and the need to protect yourself? Yeah, in particular, I'm thinking, Melissa, you're talking about the ability of people to, to talk about sexuality and to ask a question. Um, if they don't trust the medium, how willing are they to ask the question? Right? I mean, is that a big factor in what you do? It is, because um, the reason I think why it's certain people, because we do have obviously media organizations, you know, the, the newspapers and all, they don't usually, they don't use that type of media. Of course, when it comes to what I do, even if they did write a letter, it wouldn't get published, <laughs> you know, using the language that you know, is not accepted. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, I still feel that there are a lot of people that are concerned about that, about giving their opinion, because at the end of the day, the backlash that may come from just asking a simple question that is sex related. I've, I've, I've seen it happen. I've seen there are times that I've posted something or asked a question. And instead of someone directly making a comment and, you know, even, even if they've had a similar experience, they would rather choose to send an inbox and then I'll share it and pretend like, they would rather I pretend like it was my thought instead of, you know, it being theirs. It really does make uh, what I do, I think, and what everybody does very, um, very, very difficult. Because what inspires a people to speak more openly is when they see somebody else doing it. Mm -hmm. And when they see someone, you know, wanting to be anonymous, it's like, oh, somebody told that story and they don't want to, to speak out. Why should I? And I saw that when I started the blog. 
But then as more people are beginning to share their own stories, I had one um, uh, um, guy share uh, his story about getting circumcised mm -hmm. and why he did it. Because government has been trying to push that to get men, men circumcised with the levels of, of, of HIV. And the moment that he, you know, spoke out and I, I had a story on, on my blog and Facebook page as well, everybody now started, you know, it's like he had opened the, there was a face that they could relate to. Mm -hmm. There was someone real. But as long as it's anonymous and the way that people respond to, to such issues, it really does make it difficult. And the, unfortunately, I would say there's really not so much that I as an individual can do about that, mm -hmm. except when they request to remain anonymous, you oblige. Right. I would like to steer the, 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 the topic over to Jutea, who I, um, I know has encountered some opposition to some of the work that you're doing. One of the things that Taya said to me, said to the, the group earlier in the week was that in, in, in Brunei, uh, the official, uh, the, the government position is that there's no need for a feminist movement or a feminist consciousness in the country because it, everything is perfect. Uh, there's, it's not that we're against feminist consciousness, but women have everything that they could possibly need. So why? There's, there's no point. Uh, so I, I can imagine that for you to say we need a Muslim an Islamic feminism in, in, in Brunei, that's, that's a subversive thought to the government, right? And what has been their, their, their response? And what has been the response of people who, who, who are with you, who read your magazine and who read your blog and who believe in the things that you believe in? Uh, so I'm a big believer of altruism and the great thing about um, the more opinionated um, females or trans uh, Bruneians is that they are very likely to support me and um, we've had several um, male-led websites uh, directly attacking white Bruneian feminism. <laughs> there was one called Nage Bruneian Feminism and um, a lot of women just laughed it off. And there was another website um, very recently um, who tried to attack me and this other woman who's also a more articulate than I am when it comes to talking about Islamic feminism. Um, and he tweeted us um, the stuff that he wrote, but we kind of dismissed him to the point that he gave up writing. So uh, the great thing about um, the people that I associate with is that they're very positive people and they're very supportive of each other. And they're, they have this really strong idea of women supporting women, even though they don't agree with the women. And we have various uh, different people from different political spectrum um, contributing to the website. Some are looking into the idea of sexual harassment, some are uh, looking into the idea of leadership, uh, female leadership. But um, regardless of how much they disagree, um, we do get a lot of backlash. Um, we tend to support each other. And I think that's the wonderful thing about um, the people that I associate myself with, that we know that we're doing this and we're getting a lot of backlash, but we know that we also have each other's backs throughout. So I think you said there is Dorka yeah. online. Sorry? Is Dorka online? Unfortunately not. Okay. Um, There's a question in the chat. Yeah, a few questions. And first of all, uh, Deborah Brown joined us from APC. Oh, and hello. APC has a big uh, internet and gender program, so maybe they want to mention something about it. Um, one question from Coffee from Ghana. Uh, he basically you know, expressed um, overwhelm at uh, the number of um, some nude pictures of females in Africa on social media and Facebook, um, which I think raises a question of is the internet, do you see the internet more as a threat? You know, potential threats, given you know, in terms of hate speech and harassment, or more as an opportunity. I mean, I guess you know, we have we both, both aspects. Yeah. Obviously, um, there's another question for ISOC, maybe we can see that later on. Uh, is, what is the work that ISOC is doing to empower women in tech of STEM? And finally, a question that I think we can take at the end, uh, which is more about the program from Jolly McFly, New York ISOC chapter. Uh, will the fellows be coming to Washington uh, as they did? Uh, and is there anything? 
So maybe we um, tackle that question of um, there's always there's there's good and bad. I was seeing something uh, the internet enables opportunities, but also sometimes the extremes of human behavior come through as well. To what extent is it is it is it more of a threat, or is it does the opportunity still outweigh those threats? And how do we deal with those? Those concerns. I know some of you are really focused on that harassment, violence. Actually, from my side, I think now both, but later will be the positive side is more efficient and strong. Because I believe that anything at the beginning, you know, I'm talking about internet, it's really not, what, 20 years now? Mm -hmm. It's nothing, really nothing, you know. Uh, if you're talking about newspapers, radio, etc. But anything new, people still learning like small, like little baby, growing up with something, is trying to deal with. It. This is why our mission is to create tools that can invest in this world, taking people into the right direction. What is the right direction? And who's saying this is right or not? People at the end. But we're doing our best to create good content. Good content will come with good tools. This is what I believe. Um, he just he said there are so many new pictures. What did he say? Africa? In Africa. Uh, yeah, so yeah. Yeah. Ghana. Yeah. Yes, the question was. Uh, well, he made a comment. He was overwhelmed with how intense of pictures uh, and motion pictures of video of African female celebrities in social media, such as Facebook. I, I think uh, people pay so much attention to because a woman did it, and you don't want to let it go. If she makes a mistake, you want to stick it to her and continue. Um, yesterday, I was just hearing a story of. Um, um, a young girl back home who was involved in some sex video. It's been over, it's been years since that happened. But every single time she goes to a club, it's an issue. Somebody brings it up in the media, which I personally feel is very unfair because if you do look at some of the Facebook pages in my country, I shared this yesterday, is that there are so many positive uh, pages where women are sharing content about, you know, uh, entrepreneurship, for example. These are there, and on a daily, amazing things that women are accomplishing and how they are empowering each other. But the mere fact that somebody gets to do one wrong thing, if it's a man, it's quickly forgotten about. <laughs> if it's a woman, every single day, every other day, they, they continue bringing it up. Yes, there are going to be scandals, just <laughs> they are, in men do it. I'm not saying it should because the man did it, a woman should do it. But at the end of the day, we need to pay more attention to positive things that happen. A mistake is made, you move on. Concentrate on something else that is, that is more positive. I don't agree to say there are more naked or uncensored uh, uh, pictures of, of African women on the net. It's just that people are paying more attention to that. And not paying more attention to the positive things that are happening. I mean, uh, what about you? I mean, you yeah. you working? There's a story I want to tell. Yeah, please. please. There was one of our beneficiaries, a uh, woman survivor of domestic violence. She was placed in our shelter for some time with kids, and uh, this is, uh, we keep the uh, address of the shelter in secret, so it's not spread publicly. And it took us a while to realize that you know. After some time, her husband got to know the address. And we could not, I mean, she uh, signed the contract that uh, she's not allowed to spread the address, etc. and we released her. And then uh, we understood that uh, uh, in her phone, there is an app that her husband has found to follow her. So whenever she went, whenever she goes, uh, he knows where she was uh, with kids, uh, visiting her parents, and then, and we we'll also asked for IT help and uh, proposed her whether she wants to change her phone to get like a very simple one without you know, possibility just to make info calls. And then she said no. I don't want because I have, I don't want, I already left my home, I left my family. So uh, now if I will get this simple phone, I will cut all my social nets. I don't want to do this. 
He says, please help me to bring him to, to responsibility, to accountability. I don't want to sacrifice my life because, you know, my life was like shrinking all the time. He was falling. So, I mean, for me, this is an answer. Yes, there, there are a lot of threats. There are a lot of, uh, you know, bad fashion coming to our region in terms of uh, hate speech against women. And there is very uh, famous example of Anita Sarkisan being followed and threatened in the US. There are a lot of uh, sexual advertisement. Women, you know, you know, whatever you sell, you always use the image of food. Whatever you sell, like food, doors, cars, you know, whatever. And uh, uh, these are kind of unavoidable, but for me, it does not, uh, how to say, how to say, overweight the value which internet provides to share, to communicate, to mobilize community, to do networking, to raise voice together as women, to find this collective place, to meet together, raising our issues. So that's the answer. Deborah, I wonder if I can put you on the spot a little bit. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about the work that APC is doing um, with women and empowerment online? I know you've got a, a, quite a lot of activity in this space. Sure, and let me introduce myself and also apologize for coming a bit late today. I work with an organization called the Association for Progressive Communications, and we're both an organization ourselves based in South Africa, and we don't actually have offices, but we all work remotely around the world. Um, and then we also have a network of member organizations. And APC actually was started as a women's rights organization using technology to connect women across different movements around the world. And I actually work in the policy program, so I'm not the best person to talk about our women's rights work, but I can give you some examples of the type of work we do. And it's just been really interesting in, um, for me to hear the stories around the room, and um, I'm hoping that maybe we can draw some connections, and I can connect you with some colleagues one area of work we do is on violence against women online. So we've done quite a bit of research, um, a seven country research project looking at manifestations of violence against women online, also looking at strategies that women use to take back um, what we call the campaign called Take Back the Set. And so that's about sharing strategies of women to both back to access to justice and to protect themselves online. Um, the outcome of this latest phase of the research showed that there's very little of any access to justice using traditional justice systems. And so a lot of times women are actually using tools, encryption, um, other types of anonymity tools to, to protect themselves. And so the next phase of the research is really looking into how to get access to justice. So the first step is, of course, recognizing technology and violence against women as violence against women. And that's something we've been advocating for at the UN here this week, but also at the national level. And also looking at the role of intermediaries because oftentimes it's intermediaries, the online, the, um, the platform, social media platforms, and other types of intermediaries that actually are playing a big role in how um, how violence women online harassment is is dealt with. And um, another area of our work is actually doing capacity building and tech, well, we don't like to use the term capacity building more tech um, exchanges. So we have a feminist tech exchange um, sort of approach that we've had in many different countries, bringing women together, sharing tools, and actually making tools that are more suitable to their environment, so they're not a one-size-fits-all solution. And also looking at internet governance, and we're piloting a new program called Gender Internet Governance Exchange. It's sort of a crash course to help women understand and get um, comfortable in internet governance spaces so that they're able to engage and bring their issues to, for example, the Internet Governance Forum or other policy places that might seem a bit um, abstract or difficult to access. Um, so we're doing our first one in Asia, coming up at the end of this month at the Asian Internet Governance Forum. We'll be doing one in Latin America and Mexico and also in Africa. And we're actually looking at one in Meta. Um, that's, it really depends on what country is chosen. The Arab idea hasn't been announced yet. So that's something we're looking at, both connecting um, sort of the policy spaces with the, the gender perspective. And I think the last thing I'll talk about is we developed something called feminist principles for the internet. Based on our experience working in different communities and our research, we found that there's a need to imagine feminist internet. What does the internet look like from a feminist perspective? And even an example like there's like, how many principles, but there's a number of principles that deal with things we might look at from a human rights perspective, like surveillance. The surveillance is often looked at as government surveillance against citizens, or we're looking at intimate partner rights, surveillance, or different types of power dynamics that 
you would necessarily deal with in a more mainstream or typical space like at UN. So we developed these principles. We're still very ongoing uh, documents in the next meeting um, to, to look at them will be in uh, the end of this month also. So they're an evolving process and I'm happy to share those with you and see if they resonate in your work and if they're useful. Thank you for that. I, I think um, you know, for those of us in the public policy space, um, it's important to understand, or we hope for, for you to understand, you know, the internet, you, you've um, taken this technology and you, you run with it in your environments, You're, you've identified opportunities. Um, for us, it's important that we not take the, the internet as a platform, the open internet, safe, secure internet for granted. There are a lot of pressures against it. There are governments that are threatened by some of what you're doing. Um, there are companies that would benefit if we would all be locked into a certain platform or a certain technology. Um, there, there are, um, and the governance, so who's, who's in charge of this? Um, it seems like a network, you go into the cloud and it all just kind of works out. But in fact, there are a lot of different components to it and there are people who would very much like to be in charge of it. So, um, and so there are consequences of those choices for all of you and um, for the work that, that you do in your country. So I, I think from some of what Deborah is speaking about, it goes to both the tools that you need in your daily lives to do the activism and the things that you're trying to do, but also just find ways to get you more involved in advocating for this tool in your government and policy spaces, because it's not a sure thing. Um, there's, there's quite a lot of pressure up against it. We've dealt, we've touched on some of these issues over the course of the week, internet governance, right. net neutrality, what's the future of ICANN, and ah, okay. movie, not, not in a profound way, but just mm -hmm. you're out there. And um, I, I, what you say is, is, is obviously true. There are governments who believe that they should be in control of, what, of who has access to what, and as everybody at this table knows, I think, there are governments that do that today, as Absolutely. we speak in China and, and, and Russia, to give just, just, just two examples. And often their justification is um, the abuses, the abuses, some of which we've talked about that are perpetrated on, on the internet, some of them having to do with, you know, with, with pornography and others having to do with uh, intimidation, uh, verbal violence, and, and internet harassment, as I'm sure again everybody knows. Cyber bullying in the United States is, 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 is a very, very hot topic. And um, the only, I think the best argument against, against those, uh, uh, those who would favor government control of the internet is, is responsible use for, amongst those of us who consider the internet a potentially progressive tool. Uh, but I don't know how the responsible ones can uh, uh, get together. I think there's strength in numbers, and um, it's only by by acting together that um, that that people in favor of a free and responsible internet can win the argument against those who favor government control. Well, and that was a big discussion this morning at the Human Rights Council. Of um, I think David Kay said this well. Uh, the issues around security and anonymity have often, uh, the media headlines often go straight to public safety, national security, terrorism, et cetera. And they, there's not as much being written and talked about and the ways in which security actually enhances innovation and enhances the expression of rights. So when you trust the medium, you're willing to interact and ask the question about sexuality that you wouldn't have otherwise asked. Uh, and it is, it is enhancing of rights. It's not just about security to take away rights. And this is a big tussle that's going on in policymakers. But the, the, the pendulum right now seems to be shifting in favor of we need to, to take these tools away from users and as governments take care of the security question ourselves so we can control, so we can provide the security, and less about empowering users um, to make those choices for themselves. 
Kathleen, you do a lot of work in this space. I don't know if you want to weigh in on, on some of the, the things that the technical community is working on in this, in this realm. Um, let's see, so for privacy specifically? Yeah, I think so. Sure. Um, we have a, there's a ton of interesting work going on and some of it's motivated from issues uh, discussed here today and some of it's uh, motivated from uh, the Snowden re revelations. But I think more importantly, the privacy push came from issues like those being discussed today. Uh, DNS pri uh, deprive, which is DNS privacy. That's an interesting effort. And I mentioned that I think a little bit earlier where you'd obscure host names and domain names so that your searches on the internet wouldn't be readily apparent. And so that's interesting. Um, another one is that uh, there's a group called TCP Inc. And they're actually looking to bake encryption in at the TCP layer so that you wouldn't have to put another layer of encryption on top of that with another protocol like TLS or IPsec. Um, and so sorry that I'm throwing acronyms at the group, but basically at the very core level of your connection, from one host to another host, it would be encrypted and protected from host to host. And so that would be a very big improvement. Um, let's see, we're also doing things just to uh, make it easier for sessions to go from clear text to encryption. And they might be breakable, but you would have to be targeted to break that session. And this particular work, we call it opportunistic security. So let's say you're a user at a web browser, and if you look up in your location bar, it says HTTP colon slash slash. Right now, when you send traffic across and there's no S on the ends there where it says HTTPS, your traffic's not encrypted. And it just travels across and clear text. Everything can be searched and looked at. And so what the IETF is pushing for with all protocols, not just web traffic, is to have that encrypted and opportunistic encryption, the difference that this makes is that we're trying to make it very easy to have that uh, negotiation for the session occur. Uh, right now it's very difficult because you have to have keys on either end to enable this encryption to happen and oftentimes certificates as well. So there's a lot of administrator work that has to happen to make that possible. So we have uh, uh, some folks working on ways to make this easier so that you just enable that session and you as a user would be completely unaware that what looks to you like an unencrypted session is actually encrypted. Now that particular type of encryption is something that could be broken. So let's say you're a terrorist and somebody wants to uh, monitor what Sally and I are talking about because they suspect us of something um, and we're just using opportunistic encryption. It could absolutely be broken but if one of you was having a conversation about human rights, um, sexual harassment, or one of the other topics, you might also be using opportunistic encryption, but you, your conversations, or you might not have been identified as having been in, of interest to break that session. It's too costly in this new mode to break all of those sessions to be able to monitor everybody's traffic. So it's a very interesting progression in how we're looking at security because had you even proposed this a few years ago, people would have said no. And in fact, they did say no. Um, everybody wanted absolute security. If you're going to set up an encrypted tunnel, it's the unbreakable was the theory. And we've changed that because if you do this in mass, it's impossible to monitor everybody's session. And so privacy increases. Um, I think those are some of the, the major changes because we're looking at this in new ways now. End-to-end um, -end email encryption, there's an increased focus on improving those capabilities and some of the big mail providers are behind these efforts. So like Yahoo and Google Mail, they're involved in uh, efforts to re-energize open PGP. So your webmail clients would actually be able to use uh, open PGP and that in the past was not possible. You had to have a full, you know, IMAP client or a full client for your email on your desktop to be able to do that end-to-end -end encryption. So that's interesting. And we also have a push for having 
layered encryption. So uh, the protocol, if you've heard of SSL, that was replaced by something called TLS, uh, Transport Security Layer, I think. Um, so that layers on top of your email traffic, it layers on top of your web traffic, um, and even your instant messaging. And so the people who operate these servers have had a good push to encrypt traffic for your, let's say, instant messengers, uh, instant messaging, where from server to server, all of your traffic is now encrypted. And so you only have to worry about from you as a client connecting into the server, and we do have some technology for that, but your, the path of your connection has, is better encrypted. And the same is true of email. So even though end-to-end -end encryption, where you use something like PGP and locally on your desktop with PGP, or there's other protocols that do this as well, you encrypt the message and then you send it. And that's, that's the best way to protect your privacy. Um, but not everybody can do that. So what we've done is, from server to server, we've put transport encryption to protect the data while it's in transit still vulnerable on your desktop, and it's still vulnerable at every other server where it gets stored. Um, but we're doing more to protect that end-to-end. -end. And so there's a big push across all protocols to enable encryption for privacy purposes. And if I went into too much acronym soup, please let me know and I'll expand further on any one of those. <laughs> well, I, think the, I think the summary of that is, is there's, you know, in the, in the wake of a lot of the revelations coming out of um, Snowden, but also that's unleashed a lot of discussion, of course, about how much are we being monitored in our online activities. And it's government monitoring, but it's also commercial. Um, and what are the implications of that for the things that we want to keep private? Do we have a choice in what we announce to the world and what we keep to ourselves when we're on the internet? And I think with the IETF, you hear a lot of pieces of the layers of the, of the network, but that's the work that's going on to, to make that more secure. And I, and I think that's, I mean, that's very reassuring that something is done by default for right. every single user. We don't have because, to remember a key. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we, we talked yesterday about PGP keys, and I gave my example of, you know, trying to figure out how it works and giving up very quickly. Um, and in addition, I think that also many of the tools that people have been using to be anonymous online, like VPNs, have actually attracted the attention of some governments in countries where, you know, which are difficult for online expression. So again, the, the less you have as a user to have a specific software to protect your communication, the more it is by default and on the back end, I think, the better. You know, and it's interesting you bring that up. I sat in on a talk yesterday. I'm at the Forum for Incident Response and Security Team, and the keynote speaker yesterday morning was from Europol, and he talked about um, people moving away from using tools like Tor that protect your sessions, and the criminals and the people they're watching are moving away from Tor because of their ability to monitor you know, this, what we all thought was well-protected encrypted data, but it was breakable. Um, they're moving away from those to other tools and it's making their job harder. And so just to have this split interaction from this session to you know, what I'm hearing at this conference is really great um, because it just makes all of this work come to surface and light and, and how important it is to provide these tools despite those that are going to be more challenged in their jobs because of it, in, in terms of their ability to monitor and protect from other types of problems. There was an article recently in the New York Times, I'm sure some of you will, will have read it. It, it, was, it took the form of a kind of an open letter to um, the guy, what's his name, Mark Zuckerberg? Mm -hmm. The guy who created Facebook in any mm -hmm. case, basically saying, let me, let me pay for my use of Facebook, uh, and in return, you guarantee my privacy. And uh, it, it, it elicited some, um, some some response from already from a lot of people in, in the United States, at least those people who read the New York Times. I think there would be um, 
I think that there, uh, many people would be happy for that for that trade off to pay a little bit in return for a guarantee of privacy, which they're not having now. But in other parts of the world, I'm I'm not so sure uh, if if they would take that that that, that bargain. Uh, somebody earlier in the week said when we were discussing the internet and Facebook that for a lot of I, it might have been in Africa, but I'm not certain. These people that they don't know what the internet is. They don't. They don't have a conception of it. They don't. They don't speak about it. They know Facebook. But as far as they're concerned, the internet is Facebook. That's that's the only thing they do on there. And they don't. They don't use a computer either. They have a. They, they have a cell phone. And one reason they have a cell phone and not a computer is because they can't afford a computer. So I, I wonder uh, if if in most of the world, which is to say the you know the non-rich world, they're just they're just going to always be kind of have to make that devil's pact. Uh, with the powers of, of, of cyberspace, you know, I'll take it for free, and I'm giving you, I'm giving you my privacy. I'm, I'm abandoning, surrendering my privacy. Well, it's a real challenge that if do end users understand the bargain that they're making when when you go online, you know, if if the service is free, that's always the adage. If the service is free, you are the product. Um, that you, you there, you're, there is a value transaction going on there. It just may not be the one you're. You're just not aware of it, right? I wonder if any of you have questions for us or things you want us to know about the work you're doing or concerns you have, challenges that, based on what little you may know of us at this point from internet society, technical community, things you would like us to be aware of. Um, takeaways that you think we should have from the work you're doing. Well, I have a question today. We uh, met with the organization uh, Trade and Development, International UN Commission for Trade and Development, mm -hmm. uh, and they actually mentioned uh, the in September there will be a summit in New York where right. sustainable development goals will be adopted. And uh, she mentioned that the internet and internet technologies uh, really like mentioned four times in this sustainable development goals. So how would you see this? Do you, I mean, do you see it among this? Because the reason behind this that IT is rather tool than the goal of the development. So how do you see this? Well, that's a perfect entree to somebody who's just joined. This is my colleague, Constance, uh, over there, and she just helped uh, spearhead a report that we wrote on the role of ICT in sustainable development. So maybe this is your moment. Thank you. Very much. <laughs> so yes, indeed, there's a, there's a discussion um, unfolding in New York currently about the sustainable development goals. The sustainable development goals are replacing what we call the MDGs, the Millennium Development Goals. Um, there was some disappointment, including in our community, because among the new goals, the 17 new goals for the next decade, there is no specific goal um, addressing ICTs or the, or the internet. Um, what I think we will see in the coming weeks, because now that they've agreed on those 17 goals, they need to figure out how they are going to finance, support the implementation of those goals. So there's a big conference coming up in Addis Abeba in uh, July, and apparently they're probably, one of the outcomes will probably be that the internet, including the ICTs, including uh, the internet, will be identified as a horizontal enabler to reach those uh, those SDGs. There's another track. Uh, the Society is very involved in the WISIS, um, the WISIS, the World Summit on on Information Society, and we see again uh, the issue of the importance of the internet in achieving sustainable development. That's really going to be central uh, to to those discussions. There's rather going to be cross cutting. Than the uh, separate focus yeah. looks like it. I think, I think so, yes. And yeah. in some ways, that's quite logical, right? Yeah. You know, your ability to, to, to achieve healthcare goals or environmental goals is facilitated by the internet. But I do think there was, as Constance said, there's some disappointment that it wasn't more explicit in the vision of. I mean, this is the United Nations setting a global agenda for the next decade, but that wasn't more explicit. Um, it's not as forward meaning in that respect as it, as it really could have been. Well, bu bureaucracies, whether national or international, are, are usually 
a step or two behind right. the sort of organic evolution of society. They have, they're always playing catch up a little bit. Right. But next time around, in 10 years, when we've moved, the rest of the world has moved on to something bigger and better, they'll, they will address it. That's my prediction. Mm -hmm. Is there anything else? Any other comments? Um, I'm sorry. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I, mean, I have a question. Uh, are any of you involved or interact with Internet Society chapters in your countries? Just in a word, or maybe you want. No, go ahead. So, ISOC chapters are basically um, local associations. Oh, you are. I have interrupted. I know Martin would be the one who is here. I happen to work for my have Nairobi, so everything tech and the leaders tend to be there. Right. But I don't necessarily have gone for a couple of reasons sometime last year. Okay. But um, yeah, it's, it tends to be over my head. So if it's important, mm -hmm. I tell Martin, you tell me. Because <laughs> <laughs> she's, she's part of the focus group, I think she, she's in. Because uh -huh. uh, he's an engineer and also sits on ITU. What's his name? Martin Oguya. Martin Oguya, yes. I've, I've seen his name go across top of that. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, yeah in, in a nutshell, um, ISOC chapters are like local national associations that you know, are made of civil society engineers, you know, basically, every, anybody interested in. Keeping the internet open and dealing with internet related issues at the local level. Um, and we do have more than 100, mm -hmm. I think, yep. um, in most of your countries. We need to double check. Uh, but basically, they can be resources as well, uh, both for you to bring up your issues at the local level and um, also for us as ISO Global to hear you know, from, from the local issues. So, um, no, we are also very happy I think, to uh, connect you yes. uh, with the chef. So, uh, I think we have one in Palestine. We do. Now, right? yes. we do have one Where in Palestine. In Palestine. Yeah. We'll look it up for you. I'm not sure. Um, yeah, they're active. Yeah. Um, the other, there was a question in the chat about what is ISOC doing um, on uh, women and technology. Um, we have a community platform called Connect, which is where all of our members interact. And there's a specific group focused on women and tech issues um, that brings people together from around the world. Um, I should say, joining the Internet Society um, is not a uh, financial obligation anybody can join. You just have to sign up. If you sign up, you can join that group. It might be interesting to compare notes with others that are focused on some of the things that you're focused on. Um, in addition, we're very um, keen, we work with people like Kathleen and others to try to figure out how to bring more women into technology. So fellowships to the technology organizations, to the IETF, ambassadorships to internet governance um, venues, whether they're regional or global, um, are ways that we try to to raise the profile and the number of women. Um, it's similar in some ways to what ABC is doing. We all share some similar objectives there, which is that you know you have to learn the space a little bit. There's a bit of a barrier um, to entry in that uh, the knowledge base, but once you do, there's huge opportunity, and, and the more women we can have in the discussion, uh, the better. Um, and then the other is that we have a, a, a fairly serious community grants program that helps to fund local projects around the world that build out the internet in ways that are consistent with our principles, open, interoperable, free expression, et cetera. And um, those, uh, many, a number of those have gone to projects that are, are dedicated to enhancing uh, the role of women online. So there are a number of different things, um, any one of which you could be involved in, um, and certainly we welcome that. Um, like Nicola said, the chapter network is, is a great opportunity. And for many of the chapters, I think Jolly is interesting. Jolly's uh, McPhee is online from our New York chapter. <coughs> they say New York chapter, it's called New York, it's in the United States, but they actually have thousands of members from all over the world that interact on issues that are interesting. So it's, it's not a, um, some of them are more geographically focused and others are um, just a lot of engagement that happens in this community 
um, and it really is a, a community. So um, we would certainly welcome if, if this is of interest for you to participate. Um, we hope the barriers are low, um, the opportunities are high. And um, if there's nothing else, I, are we out on our time? Uh, yeah, perfectly. It's five. Um, if, if I may mention one last uh, thing. Um, so I'm working a lot on what we do in terms of human rights, as uh, Sally mentioned. Um, you know, we're going to continue to engage at the Human Rights Council, also at the local level. Uh, so you know, if, if you see issues in your countries related to free expression, privacy, or others, please reach out to me, to us. Um, we have you know, a few deliverables by the end of the year, including a paper which should look at uh, internet-related restrictions online. So uh, these are all resources that we would love to share with you and get your feedback. So I'd like to. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I'd just like to thank you for the opportunity to participate in this panel and to hear what each of you are working on. I'm definitely more inspired to go back and continue pushing on privacy. Uh, you know, especially in light of the challenges each of you face. So, uh, thank you. Thank you. And I want to say thank you to the to the Internet Society, to those of you who participated and gave some of your valuable time this afternoon to, to, to the group. I think it was it was an enriching session and, and, and we very much appreciate it. And, and secondly, thank you for pointing out, Nicola, that there are local chapters, that people can join local chapters. It's only by, you know, that's how you raise consciousness. That, that's how you get people to, to empower themselves by joining up with each other. So I think it was a very important point at the end. And I, and I hope people will, will take advantage of it. You already are. Right? And, and Jolly asked a question in, in the chat about whether the program would go on to Washington. I think you said earlier the answer to that is yes. So this group is meeting for Washington on, on Saturday, Saturday. They'll go to Washington. They'll have Monday, Tuesday, full days program days in Washington. On Wednesday, they fly to San Francisco. And on Thursday and Friday, they'll be in Silicon Valley. And on yes. Saturday, everybody goes back. So they'll, they'll see, right, why not? I mean, they are Internet Freedom Fellows. They, they should go to Silicon Valley. Absolutely. <laughs> well, I, I, just uh, for me, thank you very much for taking the time to meet with us. Uh, it's inspiring to hear what you're doing. Um, it's inspiring to know we're all part of the same community, um, and we really do believe that. So um, uh, all the best in your endeavors. We hope that you stay in touch. We are a resource for you um, if, as you need it. Um, and um, I think we're headed out into the reception, right? Is that we have, yeah, a few drinks and a little food toast. Just there, so. Yeah. Okay. Very good. Well, thank you very much. It was it was a real pleasure to have you here. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks, yeah. to everyone thanks, thanks to everyone online. Thanks to everyone here and online. Bye. Bye.